In 2009, we were, my unit, which was uh, most decorated infantry battalion in the entire Marine Corps, which was 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, was called in to do humanitarian assistance operations out in the Philippines, which was Operation Kitsana, which we were attached to the 31st Marine Expeditionary Unit, which conducts maritime operations all throughout Southeast Asia in conjunction with the 7th Naval Fleet, which houses one uh, landing helo deck, or LHD, among LPDs, which is what I was on called a uh, USS Denver. Ironically, that's where I'm from, so kind of felt like home. Now, um, during that operation in Quetzana in the Philippines, they had actually heard that a tsunami and earthquake hit the western part of Sumatra, which is western Indonesia, uh, Padang City more specifically. Out of all the ships in the 7th Fleet, the ship I was on was the only one that was routed to that location, which was oddly strange, but then again, this is my first humanitarian operation, so I don't know the logistics of it, but if the skipper of the ship would probably know that information. So um, this happened September 30th. We ended up getting called and dropped anchor around October 8th. We are briefed in the ward room, which is the officer's mess, where they eat um, like their cafeteria, per se. We are briefed that there is some of President Obama's family members that are present on either in the city or somewhere near there. They had a SEAL platoon that was ready to go to retrieve those people. Um, us knowing well that uh, Indonesia is also the second largest terrorist capital where they train these guys and they'll send them up to whatever theater of operation where anybody wants a piece of the United States, they can, they ship them up to go handle it. So we know that well. and. Um, we were then briefed that we were going to be armed during this operation just to also provide security for the transportation coming to basically drop off uh, medical supplies, sheltering items, food, purified water, things like that. So um, they ended up selecting certain Marines to go ahead and do this. We were only in sticks of uh, six, six Marines, so it had uh, NCOs on top of uh, other Marines to help with that. So. They, we again boarded uh, CH-53 Super Stallions, which are gigantic helicopters that are roughly 100 feet long. Uh, I love the design of them, it's my personal favorite. Um, but we ended up boarding this on the ship and we flew to the southwestern part of the city, which is Padang. Looked a lot uh, different through satellite imagery that I've recently seen. Back then is a lot different, especially because most of it was decimated on fire, rubble, flooded, you name it, basically the worst kind of scenario you could ever see. From then, um, once we touched down on this landing strip, it took probably about two minutes. Um, and then again, the pilots got radio confirmation to go ahead and drop us into certain parts. So we again dropped to a hasty LZ, which took probably about six, seven minutes to fly to from that position. And uh, we dropped to a hasty LZ. We got off the bird, and what we were instructed to do at that point through the briefing was to push to a high ground at least to get better observation. As a Marine, the tactical advantage that you get from having a, um, you know, observation from a top point is you see everything clearly. You could also, you know, coordinate from there. At that time, we had did a tactical column, which we were able to get eyes on pretty much everything, especially with six Marines, so we have the effective uh, communication at that point. If we need to engage, we can properly do it within the amount of ammunition we've got, as well as the weapons that we got, which were only M16A4s. So at that point, we decided to push forward. We trekked up about 300 meters. At this time, I have a Panasonic camera that has the ability to take photographs, it has a, a you know, ability to take videos, obviously. When we got to this high point, I was taking video camera and I had actually turned to the north, which just kind of slopes down. And right there was something that stuck out like a sore thumb, especially with jungle terrain, things like that, junk, you know, vegetation, very green stuff, was something that stuck out so well, it's always gonna be basically imprisoned in my mind for the rest of my life, and it has been for 14 years, was something that was rotating and it was transitioning between colors like a light uh, matte gray as well as a dark matte black. So in between, that's what it kept, and it was very smooth. We had uh, all looked at each other as we got online, and we decided to investigate. The further thing I want to say is that I actually took pictures and video of this before we actually trucked down. We had a dump pouch where we basically, if we expend ammunition, we want to retain our magazines, so we put those there. So I dropped my camera in there. Um, and we decided to go down. We didn't have any communications, which was weird, and that was a very odd thing, and it's something that either could have been good that we didn't, or it could have been something that could have been very bad. 
um, and it just how, however you want to look at that. Once we got down this slope, we were approximately 150 meters away from this craft. When I got to the, when we all got to the point where we could see it, just like behind here, again, Mr. Schratt, phenomenal job. You can see that the craft here actually had, uh, was roughly about 300 feet. And the reason why I know this is because you could fit three of the helicopters that we flew in on underneath this craft. It was rotating in a, a clockwise motion. The panels here that you see, um, the black ones, at least three of them, was like a Vanta black, very dark. I have no idea what that was. On the very top, there was like a pyramid structure that you could see the shadowing of it, which would elicit that was a pyramid structure. And it had an audible hum to it, um, kind of like a guitar amp if you were to unplug that, or like a transformer, it's very audible. If I was to hear that sound again, I could tell you, okay, it's probably this thing or something similar to that. It's very distinct. And the way that it was floating, which was about 10, you know, 15, 20 feet off the ground, it was kind of a very eerie thing to see because I've never seen anything like that in my life. When we got up to that point, we were then intercepted by a team of um, soldiers or um, rogue military force, if you will. The most concerning thing about this is they all had American dialects. They had American gear. They had OTVs, black they had black camouflage. They had very similar setups to what we have, but more high speed, something what you would see special operation, operation groups these days have. They had no insignias on. They had no ranks. They had nothing that would signify who they were. They had black ball caps. They had M4A4s that were equipped with ACOGs, which was a step up from what we were currently issued, as well as PEC-16 IR illumination devices that you use for night vision and uh, night patrols, things like that. So we were engaged. We had eight of them drop, put the drop on us. You could audibly hear them flow the safety selectors off. They basically started screaming at us, telling that what we were doing, we were not allowed to be there, who were we with, what were we doing there, um, threatened that they could kill us right then and there, we could get lost in the jungle, they could throw us out of a helicopter if they needed to. Um, it was very nerve-wracking at that point, especially looking to my fellow Marines and seeing the reactions on their faces too. We were all freaking scared, uh, to say nonetheless. So with that being said, each Marine was then patted down along with myself. We were, had our weapons taken from us. They were basically cleared in condition four, which means they had no round chamber, no magazine in. They dumped our magazines out of our mag pouches as well onto the deck. And then again, um, because of Marine Corps order, how things are with that, we were told to keep our military ID in our left breast pocket. So they knew that. They asked for our military identification. We gave it to them, obviously, because they have guns in our face. So provided that to them. They had something that looked like modern day uh, smartphones, but this is 2009, so it's not really as high tech compared to obviously today. So they took some pictures of our military ID and then they had something that reminded me of a BAT system, which is a biometrics tracking system that we, ha we would use. Um, this is for insurgents or anything like that. It would take fingerprints, it would take retina scans, it would take pictures of them and document them. So if there's other militaries that were coming to relieve our post, they would actually have this information too to know who they are dealing with. That's what it reminded me of and I had trouble scanning the IDs. Um, as this is going on, we're going back between these guys as well as what's going on in the background. At that time, there was four of these trucks, which were uh, F-350s, they were up armored, they were pretty beefy. They had um, weapon cases that I've seen before because of something that we've actually loaded weapons into. And they had two of them that were in the back of each truck. They also had these containers that was illustrated right here, which come to find out through recent relevations from yesterday from uh, somebody who came forward to Dr. Greer, I don't know who they are, but what they had told him and what he has told me is that this gentleman knows exactly what these were used for because they had like a cylinder on the front which is either for oxygen or what I have hypothesized was for vacuum sealing, uh, which lead me to um, suspect that they were smuggling narcotics or drugs. Um, come to find out it's more disturbing than that. Um, this gentleman has first-hand account with this and says that it was for people. It's very disheartening, especially because that part of the world have already gotten ravaged and it's something that is very hard to see right now because of what I've witnessed. And it's very disheartening. And this is why I'm up here. So they loaded these onto this uh, platform that you can see right there. And as they got up there, um, like I said, I was going back and forth. Uh, these guys are still searching our stuff. They're still you know, pointing their weapons at us. 
And uh, after the last two trucks that I saw that actually got onto that platform unloaded, they had four guys in each truck that would unload everything. However they did it, I can't tell you because, again, I was focused on this as well. And um, these trucks drove off. As that happened, this platform actually rose up off the ground itself. The top part of the craft actually met it down in the middle like this and uh, formed into one solid piece. Um, it floated right above the tree line. As soon as it was able to break that tree line, it actually had the on the corners of each of these, which was an octagonal shape uh, craft, by the way, on each corner it emanated a light. It was either red, yellow, green, or blue. Only those four colors I can distinctly remember. It didn't make any additional high-pitched sounds when it rose up. Once it got past that tree line, it shot over to the left, basically where the ocean was, at a rat, uh, so fast, um, I would estimate probably three, four, five thousand miles an hour instantaneous like that. Uh, there was no rotor wash, no exhaust that would disturb the trees, vegetation, the coconuts that were on these trees were not even touched. It produced no sonic boom. This thing was so fast. So um, as that happened, they basically had told us to turn around. As we turned around, kind of a couple things that went through my head at that point was that we're done. They actually started loading our magazines into our vet, um, back into our vests in a way that would be hard to get them to put them into a weapon and to actually, you know, charge the weapon and actually put it around in a chamber. So um, they put those in. They actually slung our M16s on their back for us, but when they did it, Marine Corps not really issued the best gear, especially at that time. So the slings back then were, I would say, subpar quality. Um, cut my neck pretty good, and they you know, kind of went in that motion and made sure they were secured so we couldn't really get them as easy. And um, they escorted us back up this slope. And they, one, they told us they were not going to, we were not allowed to look back. Two, that we were not able to talk about this. They were actually, two of the guys um, were actually talking about either, hey, should we smoke these guys right now? You know, that's what they kept saying. It was kind of feeding more into the fear at that point because, again, I don't know who these guys are. I know they had American gear. They had American sidearms as well. Um, if these guys have um, actually taken the oath like we have and then why they're going against people like us and even willing to kill um, servicemen who just even stumbled onto this, it just blows my mind and it's very sick. So as we broke atop this hill, we decided to book him. And we ran back to the LZ. There was a gunnery sergeant that was attached to the ship. I don't know this gentleman personally, but I know he's very ha unhappy with seeing us because we had actually had our weapons slung. We were not combat effective at that point if we needed to be. They asked, uh, he asked specifically why we were. We didn't tell him exactly why. We just came up with an excuse. And then um, we waited for the next CH-53 to approach, and we got on board, flew back to the ship. We turned our weapons in back to the armory. We took our gear off back in our berthing, and we went upstairs to be debriefed by an admiral that I've never seen before, and it was kind of somebody who was out of place. I don't know if he has any kind of um, relevance to this at all, but if that's the case, if he does, I hope he comes forward with that information. It would be very helpful. So as uh, we're going to go ahead and fast track to a couple days later, which we end up in Subic Bay, which is like the party town in the Philippines. So um, we had three days there of liberty. The first night I come back, because we had to report back to the ship each night, we were not allowed to stay out in town. Um, my rack was on my cam, or my camera was on my rack, and the memory card that was in it was out, and my battery was out of the camera, missing as well. So all of that was missing. The only thing that was there was the camera. Mind you, I had my locker secured. I had other stuff that was basically piled on top of that camera. So whoever did it knew what the hell happened. So um, after that, um, the other thing that was also notable with that was each of the Marines that were with me also had their cell phones taken that they brought. Even though they didn't bring them on the mission, all their stuff was missing. The other stuff, the other people in the actual platoon never had their stuff touched. It was only us six that were affected. So fast tracking back when we returned back to Okinawa, one day I had got a call from the duty that was in the barracks. Each barracks has like a duty of Marines that are you know, making sure there's still order, uh, things like that. He had been told that I needed to go up to the CP, so he informed me, so I had hightailed it up there. And oddly enough, there was nobody in the building, except for one gentleman who was uh, wearing Air Force dress blues that was missing a name tag, which I understand an Air Force policy or regulations that they were supposed to wear a name tag, and he did not have that. I gave him the proper greeting of the day, gave him the salute. He had pulled me into an office. 
and he has said, you are not allowed to tell anybody in your chain of command, I don't care if it's a general, I don't care if it's anybody, you are not allowed to talk about what happened, you can go to prison for this, or you could be killed. So he slid over a, a non-disclosure agreement, and it had two things that I can recall to this day, uh, as I quickly skimmed through it, because again, I had thought we were gonna forget about this whole mess, and uh, one was said TSSCI, and the other said Indonesia. There's only two things I can recall out of that. So I was forced to sign that. Um, I signed it, and I had um, got the hell out of there as quick as I could. I, before I did that, I tried to ask him who he was, and he would not tell me who he was. So I hightailed it back, and um, I have not spoken about it ever since I was able to recently because what the law passed. But that is my account for you guys. This is also an urging for anybody in Washington, D.C. who's a political figure please get this under control because there are people who are either being hurt or killed by this and it's something that needs to be addressed, please.